Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of Pod for Good. I am your chief philanthropod, Jesse Ulrich. And I'm your rear admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. Correct. And today we talk with President and CEO of the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice, Moises Echeverria. We discuss uh, their use of education to battle intolerance. Uh, Moises compliments us several times, Yay. unlike our previous guests. And he talks about OCCJ's many programs and how you can get involved. He also gave us a, the wonderful motto of intolerance doesn't discriminate, which we are going to use to remake the Wait For It song from Hamilton. And we're very looking forward. So look forward to that, listeners. Us singing. Please uh, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Please give us five stars because we're, we're trying really hard. I think so, Chris. And, and if your review is especially interesting, we may even read it on the air. I love reading reviews. Uh, we are also available anywhere you can get podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, literally everywhere you can get podcasts. Spotify. Come on. We have we, have, we had 14 Spotify downloads and then it stopped. So I don't know what happened there, but look us up on Spotify. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if and you, whoever's in uh, Maryland, uh, we're glad to have you as a listener. Yes, we have many Maryland downloads and one Germany download. I wonder, if it's, I wonder if it's the guy who stole my cell phone. We'll never know. Please, if you are interested in certain guests you would like us to interview or questions you'd like us to ask our, our, our guests, please email us at podsforgood at gmail.com. And otherwise, have a wonderful day. Enjoy. We are very excited to welcome President and CEO of the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice, Moises Echeverria, onto the podcast. Hi, Moises. Hello, hello. I'm very excited to be here with you, Jesse and Chris. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I have to say that I absolutely hate my voice. <laughs> so I'm really curious how this is going to play out throughout the whole thing as I hear myself talk to you. It's very, it, it's very unsettling. It took me mm -hmm. years to get over the hatred of my own voice. Which, for our audience, if you're wondering why you sound different when you're recorded, mm -hmm. it is because normally when you talk, you are also hearing your voice being vibrated from your jaw to your ear. Ah. So it's bassier. I remember watching a TED Talk, I think about that uh, recently, and I was like, oh my gosh, that, that's why my voice sounds different to me, because everyone is hearing it through sound waves, and I'm not. Yeah, which is disturbing to think about the way you hear your voice is not how other people are hearing your voice. That is weird. I've always, always hated uh, how I sound on voicemails and stuff like that. So it's good. Now I know. Yeah. So we all learned something today. Well, I didn't really learn anything. I already knew it, but. And neither did my sister. So okay. Basically, I learned. Yeah. Something you, today. Chris learned something today. I You're welcome. Something. You're Thank welcome, you. Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm sure at least one person out there that listens to this will have learned something. Today. Yeah, definitely. We hope so. If, yeah. if you are that one listener, please write in. <laughs> put it put it in your your five star review in Apple Podcasts. Please review. Make me feel like I'm not alone. Yes. So the Oklahoma Center for Community and Justice. Can you in like 30 seconds explain to us what it does and what you do there? Yeah, so we provide trainings, workshops, projects that bring diverse people together to emphasize and promote respect and understanding for everyone. Our vision is to eliminate bias, bigotry, and racism. And so we know that our organization alone cannot do, uh, achieve that vision. It requires all of us working together. And so we try to keep uh, this vision at the forefront of people's minds. Uh, and so through the committees that we serve on and the task forces, etc., we we strive to, rem to remind folks that um, we can be successful through inclusion. Uh, when we learn how to leverage all of our differences. And, you know, we've spoken about this before, but your your view is that OCCJ serves the role of accomplishing all those amazing goals via education and not like direct advocacy. That's correct. Yeah. So we have learned uh, over the years and we've been around for 61 years, which just makes me, you know, I just it's hard to imagine but uh, during this, our history, we have learned that we are really good at creating really meaningful 
educational experiences that allow people to do a lot of self-reflection and challenge their, their own preconceived notions in a way that um, helps them move forward in their journey towards being more inclusive. So um, we have learned that uh, biases are start to develop and being, being acted upon uh, when children are young. And so our programs um, that start in the second grade really help these this, uh, participants to identify what those biases are and, and then expose them to different, um, not just the knowledge that they need to overcome them, because nowadays we know that, you know, you can have uh, the findings of a study and depending whatever your flavor, you uh or your persuasion politically, you can look at that those findings and make whatever assumptions, or you know, just uh, strengthen your own your own grounding. So we provide the education, but we also prov- provide the the opportunities for these individuals to really explore why their their those preconceived notions are and and how they are founded or unfounded, and then being able to reshape those those notions so that they can overcome them. Jesse's told me some amazing stories about the camp yes. that you have. Can you can you talk a little bit about, <clears throat> about the purpose of the camp and a little bit about what it's like? Yeah. And, th- and then we can sing the song. Okay. <laughs> we don't have to sing the song. I, I will not bore you or uh, punish you with me <laughs> singing uh, camp songs. So we do a week-long retreat for high school students that we call Anytown Leadership Institute. And I was doing the math recently about this program because um, it, is, it is the most impactful program that we do. And during the program, we see these students transform themselves. This program focuses on self-awareness on social justice and empowerment and the students um, come in um, not knowing each other and and leave us uh, with really close bonds and relationships um, and feeling really empowered to be the change agents that our society needs so um, any town is a culmination of all of our programs we have uh, programs like I mentioned starting in the second grade and all the way to adulthood we have uh, programs in the schools who, that are anti-bullying and anti-prejudice based and then we have interfaith programs that bring people from different faith traditions together for respectful dialogue and then all kinds of trainings and so at any time we put everything together for a whole week over 100 hours that the students are being trained or are in small group discussions or doing activities that promote respect and understanding for all. And uh, the magic of any town in my in my um, experience with the program, which I've been to the program for over 13 years, is that um, when you create this atmosphere of respect and understanding and you're doing a lot of self-awareness, having students who are diverse who challenge an individual's preconceived notions is the key to making all of this work. So, for example, we had um, at this last this last summer, we had a large contingency of students from who are refugees, and they've been in the states for about four or five years now, but they came here as refugees. And uh, during one of the nights, they had the opportunity to share their story as uh, in, in their journey of why they had to leave their country and how they were kind of temporary in a different country until they were able to come to the U.S. and then immigrate or migrating internally from the, from dif- to a, from a different state to Oklahoma. And at the end of the, that evening, uh, when we're doing our reflections um, in front of uh, students have the opportunity to reflect on the day, and one student... Um, share how his uh, perspective on immigration had forever changed because he was able to hear from students who he had at this point developed a meaningful relationship with, hear about their struggles, uh, hear uh, the gratitude that they have for being able to be here and be safe physically, like literally they were escaping uh, death and crime and all of these awful things. And so, you know, through the written evaluations, we saw a lot more students who had kind of this this mind change or, or shift in how they viewed immigration and perceived refugees. 
that um, it was really touching for for me to see uh, how this student who had never in their in their own personal life had close interactions with someone who had to immigrate um, and now have uh, this um, increased appreciation for his own family and his own circumstances and the privilege that he holds and also appreciation for those who have sacrificed and who are trying to make a better life for themselves in um, in this country. When I went, it was called Camp Anytown, and now it's called the Anytown Leadership Institute. And I noticed that the difference between doing it in the late 90s is, and, and to now is that on top of socioeconomic and racial and religious prejudices and biases that people have, we started working on more gender and LGBTQ issues, which was very interesting to me because I thought I was well-educated in that. And I, I learned I learned new terms. I learned new subsets that I did not know about. And it's it almost seemed like I, I was trying to figure out if I, at their age, could have handled the amount of information that we gave them. It was a lot. But they... All of them were, of course, crying by the end. They're always crying. <laughs> and some of some of the advisors and counselors are also crying. But it's really an amazing experience. Like, they seem, they're so cynical on day one. They're, and they're also angry because we've taken their cell phones, which was not a problem <laughs> in the late 90s. Yeah. And then literally 90% of them don't mention the cell phone again for the entire week. Which is really fascinating. You know, we are preparing to a proposal to do a session at a conference that is, is around race relations but this year they're focusing, or next year they're focusing on the the use of technology in aiding race relations. This is the John Hope Franklin it is, Symposium, it is. yes. Which I'm on that committee, so I'm like, but that and, sounds really familiar. <laughs> and you know, it's really fascinating because through our experience, at any time we have found that technology among teenagers takes away from building these meaningful relations. Mm-hmm. And so, for since. Cell phones were a thing. We would we do not allow, uh, do not allow cell phones to be used while the students are in the program for the whole seven days. And uh, I know that some parents, especially nowadays, are not would not send their student if they're not able to have, you know, um, access to their cell phones twenty four seven because. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and I get it, you know, safety and, and, and just reassurance. And for many students, it's the first time that, they, that they're leaving home for this long with, with being away from family. And so, uh, but our experience has been that when these students do not have access to their, their phones, they are forced to interact with each other mm-hmm. in a way in which they currently are not forced to interact with each other at school because during their lunch break or, you know, when they're walking in the hallways um, or whatever, they're looking at their phones and checking on social media. Mm-hmm. And while they are more connected virtually almost 24 7 the the human connection the one-on-one connection is is um, lacking and so our proposal we're we're going to be um, talking with some of our program participants and, and asking them about their experience before and after especially as it relates to their use in their phone and their social media mm-hmm. and if they seen a they, if they've seen a difference in not just in how they use it but as as they feel empowered to uh, create social change how they're using social media to achieve those changes that they're that they're seeking I mean, I've always viewed social media as a tool and tools can be used for good or ill mm-hmm. and, you know, not, not getting into algorithms and whatnot, but generally it's really how you use it. And I feel like it's a lot easier to be angry online than it is to be thoughtful and well-reasoned mm-hmm. um, as someone who screams a lot on the internet. I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious. So you mentioned in this uh, last summer that uh, you happen to have a group of uh, refugees, right? So Going into each year, do you intentionally select based on creating a particular experience or do you kind of develop your curriculum once you know what the, the how you know what the pool of people is going to be? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have our curriculum is pretty much set mm-hmm. in stone. Um, and the participants are the ones that shape how that curriculum okay. what is emphasized, what mm-hmm. is not emphasized, and and so um, each year we talk about immigration, or I say each year. For the last several years, we've talked about immigration because it's it's mm-hmm. it's an important topic, and it's even more divisive now that it's been um, even in five, ten years. But this year was the first year that we've had ref- students who are refugees, 
And and so their story was able to come to the forefront because there was um, enough of them to where mm-hmm. it was noticeable. There was, I think we had eight students out of 50 plus that mm-hmm. we had. And so almost a ten, uh, yeah, almost uh, 15, 16% of the students were, were refugees. So anyway, so, th- so they were able, to, their story was able to come to the surface a lot more than say if we had just had one or two. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a- each year is, is the sa- we see the same thing, depending on the, the student body who's there. And, and I will say that we are very intentional to always have diverse perspectives from our students. And we look at every aspect of diversity from not just racial and ethnic gender and gender identity and rural versus urban, which nowadays, you know, now the recent uh, research that uh, shows that you can tell more about a person, um, how they're going to vote, you know, kind of some of their, their, just their priorities based on if they are, if they were born, raised and live in an urban setting or if they were born, raised and live in a rural setting. And so for us, having having uh, all of these aspects of diversity represented mm-hmm. within the student body, the participants is critical. And so we strive to do that meaningful outreach to, to have uh, students from as many aspects of diverse backgrounds as we can. I want to ask a sort of comparative question between the any towns that happened, say, between 2008 and 2016 and the any towns since 2016. And if you've noticed what if you've noticed any difference. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a really fascinating question. And and I had not stopped to think about that. But what comes to mind is advice that I received from my first boss at OCCJ before she retired. And, and that was that. Next to passion, the most important virtue that folks need when doing this type of work is patience. Because just when you feel like you're making one or two or maybe three steps forward in in just making progress, something happens that makes you realize that or, you know, you feel like you've taken five, ten steps back. And and that lesson, uh, that advice um, has stuck with me. And I've seen it not just before and after 2016, but I've seen it, you know, every year throughout different, you know, different events that happen, not just locally, but nation, uh, nationally and and um, worldwide. So with that said, um, I think that prior to 2016, I think maybe we felt a little bit more comfortable in starting to seeing how as a nation we had were making progress, having elected the first African-American president and um, just some of the messages that were coming from um, his office towards um, inclusion and acceptance and 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 uh, the steps forward towards equality in the military and, and, you know, all of these wonderful things. And so for me, I guess, um, I was reminded of how fragile all of those things are. I, I've been reminded not just since then, but uh, even before that racism is alive and well. And um, which brings me to, uh, I, I've been... I've been thinking a lot about the work that OCCJ does and how it differs from the work that other social justice advocates and organizations do. And you were kind of asking um, this with one of your first questions, which was how OCCJ tackles social justice through education and not through advocacy. And so uh, in recent years, we've seen I've seen uh, more emphasis on social justice advocates on on addressing uh, systemic oppression and on uh, focusing on our energy on uh, changing policy that's going to have impact on the largest amount of people possible. And that is very true and that is very needed. And I know that I'm personally active in, in different causes uh, for policy change advocacy uh, of causes that I care about. But what we, I think, sometimes forget is that systems of oppression or just systems in general are created by and maintained by people and that while policy will have impact on the largest amount of people, the person who is a bigot before a policy is enacted that creates more equity will be a bigot the day after the policy is enacted. And um, that's why I feel like the work of OCCJ and many other organizations um, is so important, is, is helping that person, is helping all of us, really, with all of our, our baggage and our 
perspectives and our biases, wherever we are, helping us have the experiences that will allow us to overcome those biases and those prejudices and and um, whatever, you know, whatever things that, that we've inherited from our parents and our teachers and, and things that are that are not that are not promote equity. It also seems that through your education and empowering the people who you touch, that you have the potential of creating a, a whole generation of advocates, you know, that that OCCJ may not directly advocate for social justice causes, but they're empowering other people to do that for themselves so that, you know, rather than one organization dedicating resources to advocacy, you're creating a whole generation of people who could, you know, do exponentially more. Yeah. Advocacy means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And and the way that that OCCJ does advocacy is just that, is that we empower individuals to advocate for themselves, their families and their communities, and connecting them to the resources and to the organizations who are who are doing the policy change work and the and the advocacy and the and the state capital or at the you know at the uh, with the policy makers. So so that is our our approach to advocacy is to empower and connect individuals to advocate for themselves. What's the um... What's the most difficult bias that that you're tackling? I was just going to ask that. I was like, (laughs) which which one is the worst right now? Yeah. Either the most difficult to address or the most pervasive. I think that um, intolerance doesn't doesn't discriminate, if you will. Uh, We have people in every it's actually a really good issue, yeah, and in every side or in every part of the spectrum on any one issue who are intolerant of the people on the other side. And and unfortunately, there's not, there's, I feel like there's not a lot of people, well, how can I say this? I feel like there's not enough of us who are wanting to collaborate mm-hmm. and to bring people to the middle who are doing that boldly and loudly. Um, usually we have people on the extremes uh, who are taking the mic and who are giving the spotlight and who are pulling pulling us on either direction. And uh, sometimes we see a lot of intolerance from both ends of, of whatever argument. Um, so uh, when you ask what is the, the most critical thing that, that I'm facing, I, I, I feel like the most critical thing that I'm facing is those individuals who feel there's their cause and their purpose and their opinion is the right answer for everyone and are not willing to look at the other side um, and understand how, while that perspective might be the best thing for them, that is not the best thing for somebody else Mm -hmm. because of whatever reasons. Um, And so whenever people just pull up or pull up all of these walls and are not willing to do that uh, process of trying to put themselves in the shoes of somebody else and mm-hmm. understand that perspective, then, you know, it, it takes a lot more for me and for the programs that we do to get people to make steps forward when they're not willing to even mm-hmm. understand how their perspective might not be the best per- perspective for everyone. Do you find that, you, you said intolerance doesn't discriminate, in my experience, like studying anti-Semitism for long periods of time, what it seems like is people just there. There's a group of people who like hating other people and who that hate is aimed at aimed at is sort of it's it has cycles. Right. Like the the guy who shot up the, the synagogue in Pittsburgh, right, was mad about a Jewish organization that helps immigrants. Right. So he was really mad at immigrants. Right. But he couldn't shoot them. So he shot Jews. And I feel like it bounces back and forth. Like there are, there are discriminated groups that don't like each other, but usually someone who hates immigrants usually will also hate LGBTQ people, Jews, you know, African-Americans. Like it's just like whoever, whatever is bothering them at that moment is where they're going to target their hate. Sure. Sure. And so I will add to your comment that yes, that person hated immigrants or may have hated immigrants and they attacked that group of individuals because of that but i will also say that for whatever reason and i I am not sure why but this awful lie of anti-semitic sentiment has been so disgustingly 
embedded in so many individuals around the world. And it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why, but it has. And so I think that it's not only the the dislike or the disapproval of the causes that these individuals are doing, but it's also all this hate that that has been embedded or that was embedded in this person because of religion. I actually forgot what the question, the original question was. <laughs> I, so. we, we were trying to say like, what's the what's the hot hatred right now? I guess <laughs> is, is what we were trying to ask. Like, <clears throat> is it is it <clears throat> hatred against brown immigrants? Is it you know anti semitism? Is it anti LGBTQ? Who's under attack the most oh. right now? I guess it seems like anti trans is, seems to be the new hotness. But yeah, yeah. So so when I think about the the biggest issues, forms of systemic oppression that are plaguing us, racism sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, classism. I mean, all of those things are still very um, active. And what's funny about those things is that, again, they're systems of oppression, but they're maintained by individuals. Mm -hmm. In some of our programs, we teach about the ladder of oppression. And basically what we teach is that, um, like, you, you know, genocide or one of the most awful crimes against humanity that can that can take place doesn't start immediately like you know you start with dehumanizing other people and you dehumanize people by uh, saying jokes about them otherizing them and just ostracizing them and so it starts very simple and innocent and you know an off-color joke that people hear and and even if they feel uncomfortable they may laugh or they may not feel comfortable enough to say something against that joke and it escalates to you know discrimination and acts of violence against individuals and against a group of people and then uh, it can lead to atrocities so uh with that said yeah the, the, you know the the to me uh, all of this uh the systems that i mentioned Racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia uh, are still plaguing us. And um, it's so easy to scapegoat. There's there's some loud voices who um, want to be, be able to point the finger and say all of our problems are based because of this or that. Um, and it's not true. Complex are, are, or I'm sorry, problems are complex. They require complex answers. And so just easily pointing fingers and blaming someone, it's, it's, it's not the right thing to do. Well, especially when it comes to immigration, it really, the facts mm-hmm. show how helpful immigrants are mm-hmm. to our economy. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing that people are still able to find fear in that. Like they, they pay taxes at a, at a higher rate than you know, American born citizens. They bring new businesses. It's just, mm-hmm. It's one of those things where you're right. Most pro- most problems are complex. Right? When it comes to immigration, we actually know what happens when we cut off immigration. It also mm-hmm. leads to another problem, which I feel like every time America starts cutting off immigration, we become more xenophobic as as a result because it, we start to define ourselves as who we individually are and not who we are collectively as a country. Well, and speaking of complex, I'm, I'm curious what kind of work you do with intersectionality, because that's when things get very complicated, when people are rarely one identity. So when you're talking about how people interact in the world under multiple identities, maybe a particular race, a particular gender identity, and when you bring that together, they not only deal sometimes with exponentially more oppression, but sometimes they deal with discrimination within their own groups yeah so i think intersectionality to me and at occj is the key of how we target all of our educational programs because of the very reason that you just said Um, i also feel like intersectionality uh, when it comes to empowerment is what allows individuals to understand that yes they may have an identity that is oppressed systemically but they also have an identity or multiple identities that have privilege. We are able to identify and discover ways in, in, in which to use our identities of privilege to, to advocate for ourselves. So, um, and, and for many of us, just the simple fact of living in this country 
um, and having an American passport is a huge privilege that people from other countries um, who are traveling internationally uh, do not have. So, so anyway, so inter- intersectionality coined by uh, Dr. Crenshaw is such an important um, uh, concept because I also feel like intersectionality is, is kind of the great equalizer when it comes to um, the work that we do in regards to helping people um, understand and overcome their biases is that um, because we have all these multiple identities that pull us in, in you know different directions and, and cause us to be treated differently by other people, that um, we, because of that, we have developed biases for and against people who share our identities or who are different from the identities that we that we hold. And so when we look at intersection, intersectionality in our work, we're able to help people understand, you know, generally speaking, people with these identities of privilege will develop biases for or against Mm -hmm. these other identities and so on and so forth. Um, And it also really brings a a really important concept of identity and oppression, which is the the internalized oppression. And so while an individual may have identities um, that are historically have been oppressed, because of that they may have internalized that oppression and they may be struggling with some self loathing, if you will, for lack of a better word, uh, because they keep hearing all these messages about people who hold that one identity that are negative. And so they may believe that, you know, the person that they love or that loving a person um, is a sin and that they are going to be punished um, and do, you know, all of these, all of these things. And so they start, they start just internalizing um, these ideas. So for us, it's important to to help people. Um, uh, the self awareness piece, which I keep mentioning, but um, haven't really expounded, is really really critical because we all of us have been programmed through these messages of all the systemic oppression. Um, I mean, sexism is so evident in the media, and all of us, you know, consume media and so have developed these ideas. And, and so we have to do that self-awareness of, of what are the things that I have that I am actually acting on that are incorrect. When talking about intersection, uh, intersectionality, it's hard not to get people. You, want, you don't want people to start comparing and judging each other's levels of oppression, right? It's not a competition. As, I, as I've brought up in a multitude of situations within the Jewish community, I'm like, it's not a competition about who is oppressed the most. That's not what's important here. What's important here is how and why and how do we stop this oppression from continuing. And But it's important to realize that we are all on spectrums. Even in our, even in our own oppressed group, there are subgroups, right? Like trying to explain to someone that when talking about sexism, there is a spectrum and a, a woman who's a person of color versus a white woman are going to both be oppressed, but in different ways and, you know, different strengths throughout their lives. Right. And that is as hard for people to sort of wrap their heads around because especially if you viewed yourself as an oppressed class is what you are. You want to think that someone who is very similar to you, but slightly different would be at the same level. Mm -hmm. Right. But you don't want to make it a competition, but you, you have to understand like we, no one can see someone else's oppression in real time. It's impossible. You can see your own and that's it. You can only try to empathize with someone else's oppression. And on the flip side, uh, Moise, you kind of uh, talked a little bit about, and it's something our first guest of the podcast, Marcia Bruno Todd, talks about, is that it is incumbent on all of us that when we have privilege in some sort of setting, that we use that and we understand that privilege and we use that to help those that don't have the privilege that that's where, you know, as you said, the self-awareness comes in so that we understand that having a, having privilege in some aspect of your life isn't in its in and of itself a bad thing. If you can use it to help others, you know, and that's something that, and you're aware of it and you're aware of it. Right. I think where it becomes a real issue is that when we pretend that, we don't have. And it's kind of the flip side of what you're talking about when people 
you know, have spent their life thinking, you know, I've, I, I've never had anything handed to me. I'm not, I don't have any privilege and they, they don't see the struggles that other people have to try to do the same thing. So, you know, I think that's kind of the other side of it that is important for all of us to think about. For sure. And, and, you know, I think that, uh, so I completely agree and I love uh, Marcia so much and really respect the work that she does. And, and for all of us with our privilege, we don't have to take the spotlight, if mm-hmm. you will, on on advocacy or creating change. And and I think about um, how there's so many different things that all of us can do. And and I think of, for example, the two of you, who are using your resources and your expertise in creating this podcast and really amplifying the voices of people who otherwise, um, or the messages that otherwise would not, you know, get the exposure that they should and so uh there's a lot of really creative ways for people to stay engaged and to be part of the struggle without being the face of Mm -hmm. a cause and you know spending every waking hour just fighting the good fight there's there's a lot of ways and and i i feel like at the most simple in the most simple forms you know um supporting uh, organizations and causes financially that that we that we care about and if we don't have the financial means of giving our time to volunteer towards those organizations and causes or sharing our stories or you know actually it's sharing our expertise in in different volunteering capacities um spending time writing letters to our our elected officials. I mean, there's so many things that we can do with the privilege that we have to support the causes that we care about without being at the forefront and, and you know, taking the mic or taking the megaphone and, and carrying, or carrying the banner. How can people specifically do that for OCCJ? We rely on volunteers to help us achieve our mission and and with partners. I am very excited that in recent years um, in the Tulsa um, area, there has been a lot more emphasis and talk on the on the business case for inclusion or on um, having diverse boards um, for organizations. Um, there just seems to be, you know, at the city level, uh, looking at the data in regards to inequities to be able to address those and to and to make changes. And so we rely on partnerships around the city and the, and the state to achieve our goal. And so because of that, we, we require on volunteers to, serve, to help us either be at, a, at the board level or in different committees or task forces. We have, I mentioned, a program for second graders, um, which we rely solely on volunteers to help us go into a classroom and an, an hour a week for six weeks um, to deliver the program. And, and so there's, and, you know, we are 501c3 and we receive no state or federal grants. So we are funded uh, solely through the generous private contributions of many wonderful individuals. And so financial contributions um, are important for us as well to continue our mission and work. Uh, there is so many ways for people to get plugged in um, in whatever way they're the most comfortable. Like I said, going into a classroom, helping us write or research uh, grants mm-hmm. that apply to our programs, volunteering at the board level, helping us carry the banner of OCCJ in their organization or their business. Um, so many, many how ways. should they reach out? Facebook, email, what's the best way to yeah, contact so, um, Air Pigeon. Yeah, we're pretty old school. We like the Air Pigeons. Um, <laughs> they can address the note to me uh, on the when they tie it on the yeah. foot of the pigeon. <laughs> uh, Throw it in the air. You know, we are we're active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, TikTok? And, uh, Snapchat? Uh, we don't have a Snapchat or a TikTok, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but the other three platforms, they can reach out to us there. Um, uh, our email is very simple, um, info at OCCJOK.org. Uh, that's also a great way to get a hold of us, or they can call us. Um, our website is OCCJOK.org, and our phone number is there. 
and pigeons too. And pigeons. <laughs> Are there any uh, events or anything upcoming related to OCCJ that you'd like to plug? So we are getting ready to enter our interfaith um, quarter, if you will. We have uh, several programs uh, that are interfaith based, and these programs serve um, uh, the need to expose people and hear uh, from a practitioner from a, a different faith tradition in a, in an atmosphere of respect and understanding. So we're not trying to convert anyone and all of our presenters. Um, Align with our mission, but this is not a time to convert or debate, you know, mm -hmm. religious truth. This is the teen um, trilog program, right? Which so, I went on as a high schooler myself. It's, it's so amazing. So we have two youth programs. We get One it, is, Jesse. You were involved with OCCJ. Yeah. Anyway. He's been around, and we are really <laughs> appreciative of that. Uh, and that's why he's just an amazing human being now. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so we do two... Uh, team programs that are interfaith. The first one is Teen Trialogue, which takes place on the last and first Sundays of January and February. Uh, so in about eight weeks. And this program brings high school students from different congregations together for dialogue around different themes uh, having to do with theology. And uh, what's very neat about this program is that... Um, we don't have an adult presenter kind of just sharing uh, with the youth information. They We have a theme and the youth leaders work with the youth beforehand to make sure the youth are well informed on their own faith perspectives about that theme. And then they come and in small groups, they share with each other. Um, so it's very neat in that in that way. The other one is we do a, um, an interfaith tour where we go to multiple um, or different uh, religious venues to to be in the space uh, where people from different religious uh, religions worship, and then to be able to ask questions on the basic tenets of that religion. So um, that is going to take place in May. Um, so we still have a little bit of time, and our staff currently is working on um, any town finalizing the details so we can begin recruitment for any town, which takes place in the summer for high school students. Next, early next year, we're gonna start recruitment then, and we have um, monthly discussion groups uh, that are interfaith based, and this is for adults, and anyone is welcome. Um, and they are on the second Mondays of the month at the University of Oklahoma Tulsa campus where where uh, people come together and are able to share again from their own perspectives on whatever the theme is for that month. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So again, we'll, we will list all the different ways to connect with OCCJ in our episode notes as we do. And I guess, and now it is time for Moises to pick his nerdery piece of choice. And so I'm going to pause it. And when we come back, Moises will have his thing. And we'll talk about it. <laughs> So for our listeners, Moises picked my Homer Simpson Chia Pet that is sitting on my desk. So what, what called to you? So growing up, uh, that show was kind of forbidden in my house. <laughs> and you have to remember that I was living in Mexico. And so um, we know that it was a show that was kind of crude and had just kind of insensitive jokes. And so my friends are like, oh, you shouldn't watch it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we'll watch it anyway <laughs> and uh, found it not really that funny, but like just the fact that we, we kind of knew we we're not supposed to watch it mm -hmm. made us just want to watch it more. Uh, and so I have so many memories uh, of me watching The Simpsons uh, just because uh, and not really being necessarily like super entertained or amused by it. Yeah, no, the, the the fact that parents didn't want people to watch The Simpsons made The Simpsons more attractive. Yeah. It really, it was self-defeating. Mm -hmm. Because really, especially by today's standards, The Simpsons is tame. Yeah. In comparison to Family Guy, South Park, you know, all the Netflix cartoons, which are apparently super weird. Yeah. I I remember I'd, I was allowed to watch The Simpsons, but I couldn't watch Beavis and Butthead. That oh. was the, the no-go. My, again, my, my parents never were like, don't watch this. Because they, they knew it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, well, they knew I was stubborn. And two, they, <laughs> they were just like, listen, like, TV isn't real. Like, do you understand that? I'm like, yes, all right. They're like, watch whatever you want. <laughs> so, all right, well, excellent. Well, we will get a picture with you with the, yeah. uh, the, so funny. the Homer Simpson Chia Pet. And thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us today. Thank you so much again for having me. Really appreciate you both. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you all for listening. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation with Moises. It was it's very fascinating. I love every time I talk to him, I, I learn something new all the time. And now I have a new uh, interesting tagline when I talk about intolerance, which is intolerance doesn't discriminate. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, where we can be found by searching P-O-D, the number four, G-O-D. And of course, anywhere podcasts can be found. Please like our Facebook page, where you'll see fun pictures from our recording sessions and where we post the pictures of what our guests decided to nerd out about. Get it done, Tulsa.